especially glad to see so many young people here because it's, this subject is particularly important for you. And I'm especially concerned about the intergenerational issues of equity and justice, which I will emphasize. Um, oops, that's not the right button. Uh, this one, yes. I what to do. too. Let me see if I get rid of that. Just a clip. Oh. <laughs> Escape. Escape. Okay, thank you. Now I've tried these arrows. Okay, that's better. All right, I'll stay away from that one. Um, yeah, this, uh, there is, unfortunately, a large uh, gap between what is understood about global warming by the relevant scientific community and what is known about global warming by the people who need to know, and that's the public and the policymakers. And it's hard for you to believe, you know, if you stick your head out the window, the weather seems great, and we don't see much unusual happening. But the truth is, we have reached uh, a point, a crisis point. And the reason, one reason that it's hard to notice it is, first of all, there are large weather fluctuations of 10 degrees or 20 degrees from one day to another, um, which causes you not to notice slow changes that are smaller than that. Um, and the climate system has inertia, which is especially due to the ocean, which is four kilometers deep, so it takes it a long time to respond to a change a change in a forcing, which I'll uh, talk about. But so as a result, the changes that uh, humans have made to the atmospheric composition, only a fraction of the ultimate response has, has occurred yet. There's more uh, that's in the pipeline, even if we don't make any more changes. And uh, also the climate system has tipping points. You can reach a point where the changes don't occur very rapidly, but you reach a certain point and then suddenly things happen much faster because of positive amplifying feedbacks in the system. And that makes the danger of losing control of the system. And uh, the bad news is that we have realized in just the last couple of years that the dangerous level of atmospheric greenhouse gases is much lower than what we thought. The good news is that that means we're going to have to make some changes which actually have a number of other benefits, um, including uh, for human health and agricultural productivity and other things which I'll mention. Uh, this, <laughs> that's my uh, newest grandson. And I gave a talk last week in Virginia Tech and they rearranged the time for my talk so I could get home in time for Jake's uh, first birthday. Um, but there's another reason for that. I, so I admit, that's why I made this chart to show them. But um, there's another reason to show one of my grandchildren, and that is that I, you know, I talked about this subject in the 1980s, testified to Congress, and it got um, a lot of publicity then. But I decided that was not what I wanted to do. And so I got out of that business completely. And after 1989, I testified in 1988, 1989. And I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a public speaker, and I don't enjoy it. And I, don't, I prefer to do science. And there are, other, there are some scientists who really like it, so I decided to leave it to them. And for 15 years, I wasn't involved. I didn't go on television or anything 15 years. But then, in the current administration, in 2001, I had had the opportunity to speak to the Vice President's uh, Energy and Climate uh, Group, uh, six cabinet members, and actually I got to speak to them twice. And of course their policies were not, were, were um, not addressed to really reducing emissions, they were, um, so, but they said they were open to more information. And, and the president declined to uh, join the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, 
But they said they were open to more information. And I did get the opportunity then in 2003 to go back to the White House and, and present what I thought was much stronger evidence for what we, that we were really reaching an emergency uh, situation. And still um, didn't get uh, make any progress in affecting policy. Um, but I just, and so in 2004, I, over a few months period, decided, uh, thought about this and decided I didn't want my grandchildren to say, um, Opa understood what was happening, but he never made it clear. So I decided to start um, writing things which could be understood by a wider audience and, um, and giving some talks. Um, now, um, and so I've done that now for four years. I wouldn't say that it's affected any policy yet, but anyway, I, I have um, been giving a few talks. Now, one of the reasons that it's hard for people to notice anything is that the weather fluctuations are larger than global warming. And so if you look at, even if you average the weather over a month, the temperature anomaly relative to a period of climatology can be warmer than normal, normal or colder than the climatology. Some places are red and yellow, which is warmer, and some places are blue, which is cooler. So there are more places warmer than normal, but it can go either way. Um, but if you average those anomalies over the first seven years of this century, you see that actually the anomalies are above normal almost every place. And they're larger at high latitudes. These are anomalies in degrees Celsius, so you multiply times approximately two in order to make degrees Fahrenheit. But um, warmer, larger at high latitudes and low latitudes because there are amplifying feedbacks at high latitudes. As ice and sm snow melts, it exposes a darker surface which absorbs more sunlight and that magnifies the effect. And it's larger over land than over ocean because the ocean has this inertia, so it's only partially responding to the forcing. And larger in the northern hemisphere than southern hemisphere because the southern hemisphere has more ocean and it mixes deeply around uh, Antarctica. So the warming so far is uh, eight tenths of a degree Celsius in the last century, which is about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it fluctuated for a while, both be for various reasons, uh, competing forcings and natural variability. But the last 30 years, it's been a fairly steady uh, warming trend, with most of the three quarters of the warming in the last 30 years. Uh, this, these are two other grandchildren, and uh, I, when I uh, talked to the uh, vice president's group cabinet members, I try to explain what a climate forcing is. A climate forcing is a perturbation of the planet's energy balance. So for example, if the sun became 1% brighter, that would be a forcing of about 2 watts per meter squared, because the Earth absorbs 238 watts per meter squared of energy from the sun. Um, and so, and the amount of greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, that we've added to the atmosphere, those gases are transparent to sunlight, so they don't affect that, but they're opaque, they're, they absorb infrared radiation, or the heat radiation that the Earth emits. So they make the atmosphere more opaque in the infrared, and that means the radiation to space will arise from a higher altitude, and the temperature falls off with altitude, so that means the emission to space is reduced if you add greenhouse gases. And of course, the planet then is out of balance, absorbing more energy from the sun than it is emitting. And that causes the Earth to warm up until it gets to a point that it's back in balance again. Uh, well, the greenhouse gases that we've added are forcing of about 2 watts. So Sophie was explaining to Connor what 2 watts of energy is. <coughs> 